In this episode of the Business of E-Commerce, I talk with Taz Hassan about getting started with Amazon Private Label. This is the Business of E-Commerce, episode 35. Welcome to the Business of E-Commerce, the show that helps e-commerce retailers start, launch, and grow their e-commerce business. I'm your host, Charles Pulaski. I'm here today with Taz Hassan. Taz is the host of the Amazon Entrepreneur Podcast and is a retailer specializing in selling Amazon private label. I've asked Taz on the show today to talk a bit about his journey going from retail arbitrage to selling private label on Amazon. So hey, how are you doing today? Charles, I'm doing fantastic. Thanks for letting me on the show. Yeah, thanks for having you on and happy Amazon Prime Day. It's a big holiday. Prime day and a half and <laughs> yes. it was a struggle the first few hours, yeah. <laughs> yep. Lots of uh, pictures of that, that dog every time the page didn't load, but... <laughs> I think we're through that, so. I think so. Yeah, so thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for inviting me, man. Yeah, so wanted to kind of talk. Um, we met at an Amazon event, um, and it talked a lot about private label and everything, and you mentioned kind of starting off, going from the whole retail arbitrage, and I had so many folks kind of getting started there, and um, definitely interesting in journey, so I want to kind of just talk a bit about that and see where you started and how you kind of got to where you are today. Sure, so. First of all, excuse the thunder and lightning that's in the background. We're experiencing a crazy storm out here in Boston today. So yeah, so I started in January 2017. I I got the idea of a friend who was doing retail arbitrage on Amazon. I thought, wow, this is a great idea to make some money and actually supplement my income with my full-time job. So why not? I always wanted to have some kind of an entrepreneurial endeavor and I did a couple of things in the past, but nothing really worked out. So just so folks that don't know, retail arbitrage, can you define, because I've heard, I've actually heard a couple different definitions. So what's your definition? Sure. So what exactly, exactly what I did was get a lot of stuff, uh, some tooling, like scanning labels and boxes and all that kind of stuff. And you literally just go to stores, scan labels, figure out whether a specific item is profitable. And then if it is, you buy up as many as you can and then throw them up on Amazon. That's pretty much it. Go to like Walmart in the middle of the night and just scan a bunch of things. And then I did, I didn't do Walmart, (laughs) but I did, uh, I did a couple of other stores like, uh, Reebok stores, Reebok outlet stores, TJ Maxx's Marshall's. I, I didn't have a car, so I was renting cars and driving around Massachusetts on the weekends and just filling the cars up with a whole ton of stock and coming back, doing the same thing again the next day and then spending a few hours or many hours actually, not just a few, boxing all that stuff up and sending it into Amazon. And then as long as you were choosing the right products and you are able to actually sell those products because there are issues with gating and that kind of stuff, I was able to make a decent profit. And I did that for about two and a half months, I was fully deep into it. But how, how much I, are you talking as I day in sales, like what are we, like how much just gross like per day? About? So, oh, well, I can't, I can't really give you per day numbers. I don't even really remember. But the first month when I did it for the first couple of weeks, uh, well, uh, no, first month was about $9,000. And I got up to, I think 16 and my, my peak was at 28,000 per month in revenue. Yep. But that was me going out most evenings as well. I'd get Ubers to downtown and stores nearby and fill up bags and come back. And then on weekends, I'd rent out cars. That was my life. Did everyone at the stores think you were like a crazy person going in there spending thousands of dollars? Absolutely. Yeah. I had a lot of big work parties and (laughs) gifts I was buying for my large family. (laughs) And (laughs) and yeah, it was it was a lot of work having a full time job. And trying to do that, it was it was tough because I wasn't getting a lot of sleep because I had to, once I came back, I still had to pack that stuff up. And it's all about turnaround time. You don't want to have stock sitting at home, not doing anything, right? You want to you want it to be shipped. It either needs to be packed and on its way to Amazon or at Amazon being sold. So that was the first part of the journey that lasted around three months. And then it took a long time for the, the kind of leftover stock to sell through. But you, in the meantime, were you selling this, sorry. Or, sorry, order by order, or were you sending it to FBA and then fulfilling it from there? Oh, FBA. Oh, 100% FBA. I wasn't fulfilling any of these. That'd okay, so you crazy. just find stuff that was profitable, and then you would just ship. All, so you're just going out at night and just getting like bags and bags of products, shipping them to FBA, and then just shipping out from there every day. 
exactly exactly so you i would try and club the shipments together i do i when i got into my routine i do two shipments a week because i'd have x amount of stock so i'd usually ship on a wednesday and then on a sunday and get all that stuff out to amazon and just keep repeating the process week after week after week after week and this was 100 percent on my own there was no one else packing or labeling or doing anything for me just like the ups and the ups guy would come into like your apartment and take these big boxes i was away. driving oh you were driving I was driving these boxes in and sometimes it'd take two, three, four trips sometimes, depending on the vehicle I had. I tried to get decent sized vehicles so I could fit four or five boxes in at once, but sometimes I didn't. And I just get what I'd use whatever I had and I'd go had to have a few little trips down to UPS. But yeah, that was my jam for a few months. All right. So <laughs> so when did that start to get old? So two months in and you start to decide, okay, does this make the most sense? So what was kind so of the turnaround here? I, I always had, so even when I got into retail arbitrage, when I learned about that business model, I, at the same time, began to research other business models. But I knew I didn't really have, I knew I didn't have the cash to really go into wholesale or private label at the time. But I knew of it. So I was listening to podcasts and I was starting to, starting to learn about it. And then I moved into wholesale because I thought, okay, well, I can't keep doing retail arbitrage because it's burning me out. Like physically, I'm getting four hours, three hours sleep a night on average, and that's just not good enough to, to have a human life. So I parked that, and I stopped doing retail arbitrage completely. And then I moved over to wholesale, and I started to do, do a bit of wholesale. On retail arbitrage, do you feel like you were making a decent profit? Because I've had different people kind of in the, you know, different forums. Some people are claiming these like massive profits. Other people are claiming there's like no margin. Did you feel like it was profitable or like what was the thing there? It was definitely profitable. I mean, I, I, I probably, and I remember averaging out my margins for about 26% all in with retail arbitrage. And it all really depends on the types of products you're getting and how much risk you're willing to take. Because you can choose a profit, uh, a product that may take three months to sell, and but it could be have a 80% margin or maybe even greater. Or you can choose, and this is usually the thing I, I'd stuck with, were higher ranked products that, would get you between 30, 40% margin or, or ROI or higher. And I'd list those because I wanted something that was going to turn over very, very quickly because I wasn't in the game of, hey, you were going to hold this stock and make a profit down the line. I, I need to do this now. I want to make the money now. And that was what was really cool about retail arbitrage. And that was the the kind of uh, attraction to it because you just put, you went to, I went to a store, I bought the stock. I packaged it up, sent it to Amazon, and seven days later, it could be sold. And then, you know, a bit of time after, I see the sales, and it's great to see the sales, right? That first, that adrenaline rush of seeing you make, seeing yourself make sales is, is amazing. And so that kept on going and kept on going. But like I said, it, it was a certain point, at a certain point, I, I knew I couldn't keep doing it. So I transitioned into wholesale, thinking, okay, well, I've got, I built X amount of a pot. I want to continue building this whilst I still try and figure out private label. So let me continue to, keep turning over this cash while I'm figuring out private label. So then, yeah, a few months down the line, I started to do wholesaling for a bit. That was good and bad. I mean, I, I, I used some methods to find products that I could wholesale. But then at the same time, as I was starting to form my private label ideas, I didn't want to also keep spending time on wholesale. And I had to eventually pull out all that cash so I could do the private label work. Because the thing is, once, you, once you're doing this retail arbitrage, each month as you're growing, you need more and more cash to grow. So it's like you're getting money back, but you need more as you get larger. So it yeah. becomes this I like wasn't cycle. keeping any of that. Yeah. I was just rolling it all back in. I mean, and that's my model for everything I'm doing right now. I'm not trying to use any money to live my life because here's one really cool thing about having a full-time job is that that supplements my life. That, that my full-time job pays for my life, but also it pays for everything else I do and stuff in the business. So I put in between three to four thousand dollars still a month of my own cash into the business to enable me to buy more stock or launch new products and that kind of thing. Yeah, that's one of those things that people as you're kind of getting started, you don't realize that e-commerce as you grow requires more cash. Um, you can start pulling profit at some point, but like if you want to get larger each month, you need to keep reinvesting and that needs to come from somewhere. Absolutely. And if you're not making crazy margins, on your products and the, and the stuff you sell, it's really tough to not reinvest everything and grow rapidly. If you if you have any intention of growing rapidly, I highly recommend you roll in any profits you have back into the business 
and keep keep putting that in, keep feeding the feeding the beast basically, because you're creating a bigger snowball the more you feed it, feed your feed the little machine. Yep. And it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and and eventually you're going to get to a point where you're like, wow, okay, now I can actually pull some stuff out, and it's not going to affect the growth so much. But my plan is for between 18 months and two years not to take anything out. Okay. So. Now you say wholesaling. When you say wholesale, we talk in domestic wholesalers, overseas, you know, what kind of wholesalers? So all domestic wholesalers, I don't always know where the products are coming from. And I actually had a friend who I was wholesaling with who imported from China. So I'm not sure whether you class that as domestic wholesale still. But I would, yeah, I'd buy a, a set of stock and put it in. But I didn't really know that much about Amazon at the time, right? I was still figuring things out. So I didn't know that, hey, if I buy 1,000 units of this product and the star rating is three and there's 20 other people on this listing, it's going to take me eight months to sell through this stock. Like, I didn't really understand what those numbers were. So again, I made another mistake there where I just put a whole lot of money and I was like, okay, great, go, let's go and do this. And didn't sell through all the stock or it was taking time to sell through. And at uh, it was really close to that point when I, I, I didn't wholesale for very long. I did it for maybe one and a half, two months. And I thought to myself, no, I, I don't want to do any of this stuff anymore. I want to build my, I want to have my own products. I want to build my own brand. And I want to be in control of the end-to-end process because then I'm in control of my own fate. And I can work as hard as I want, be as smart as I want, learn as much as I want, make mistakes with my own money and not have to worry about, hey, well, someone else is coming on my listing or this person's changing this price. I mean, Wait, there are. <laughs> you can, we can get into it, but people can come on your listing and hijack a listing. You know, you want to be brand registered. registered. This is all private label stuff on Amazon. But I, it, when you do private label, one of the benefits I see is that you can actually build a brand. You can build a suite of products that complement each other. You can cross sell. There are many, many benefits. The risk is that it's all on you, right? All the money you invest, if you make an issue, if you have an issue, if you have recalls with a product, that's 100% on you. So it's there's pros and there's cons to doing it because with wholesaling what people and kind of the average person doesn't realize when they're hitting that buy button there's like you said 20 other wholesalers behind that person um they sell the exact same product they get them from the same place and you're basically competing over price and it's not like they know oh i bought it from xyz wholesale and they're going to come back and buy from you again and be a repeat customer they don't even they just get the, pa- the package in the mail they see a pack and slip and go oh hmm, that was someone different they have no idea, no affiliation. They're not your customer. So they just kind of, they don't, it, the brand belongs to the wholesaler, not to you, basically. So you're, yeah. you're just a pastor, basically. And like you said, if someone wants to come in there and sell it at, you know, a dollar loss per unit, they can do that. And there's nothing stopping you from, you know, someone just going there and selling everything at a loss. And that was a challenge I had with wholesale. I mean, trust me, there are people doing amazing numbers on wholesale and doing really, really well. It was just for me, not the model I wanted to pursue. I found it challenging to maintain like estimates of how much I could make because my margins would constantly fluctuate, usually downwards because people would, new people would come in and hammer the price down and then the same thing would happen again and again. And I was like, mm, I, I don't really want to be part of this model. And the real value in wholesale is the relationships and constantly turning stock over. Now, I, for me, it's definitely a business, but I'm looking at building a brand that I can eventually exit. And I couldn't do that by building either a retail arbitrage business or a wholesale business. I could do that doing a private label business. And hence, that's what led me to this this business model that I'm at now, which is private label. Okay, so private label. Let's. I think everyone knows, you know, wholesaling, kind of the definition of that. Private label, let's kind of define what that is. So there are there are many definitions of private label. <laughs> That's why I asked. White labeling. Yep. So what, here, let me start with white labeling. White labeling is when you basically go on Alibaba, pick something, and go and sell it. Whack a logo on, and boom, go and sell it. That's white labeling. And you put your you put your logo on. Maybe sometimes, maybe they do, maybe you do. But you, somehow a logo ends up on this product. Correct. Yep. Correct. And so where private label is a bit different is. You go in and you see something and you make a modification to a product, something that makes it different, something where you put your your entire brand on that product. You've changed the entire packaging. You've changed the way something functions slightly and you've improved. And that's what private label is to me, at least. That's my definition of it. And so that's what I went about doing. 
And now are you still finding those folks on like an Alibaba or is this like, are you going direct or what's kind of, what's the relationship there in this sort of thing? So it's a mix. I would say my, all of my early relationships were formed on Alibaba. So some of the suppliers today I found on Alibaba, there are different ways to investigate, you know, where you, where to find suppliers. Sometimes you want to just look at some, what some of the best selling products are and find out where they're coming from. It's really it's one really good way is to just find out, hey, like some of the best brands you can still that are manufactured by a specific factory, you can actually still approach those factories because sometimes they're not just looking at a hundred million dollar companies to work with. They're also looking at other smaller people that they want to work with. Because some of these manufacturers have massive amounts of capacity to produce orders. So that's one other way. But a lot of the a lot of the early relationships I formed came from Alibaba, for sure. Okay, so you kind of found the folks on there and then just built an actual relationship. With, like you found some products as the the seed and then kind of built a relationship and said, let's modify these. Let's make my own version of this, basically. Correct. So what I would do is I would, so I decided on a brand idea and I found a couple of products that I liked that I thought, hmm, I, I, I like these products and I can definitely improve them. So I would go, so what I would do is I'd take those products, I would go onto Amazon, any other websites, just Google them and see how other people receive those products. Like, how could I improve it? What were people happy with? What, what weren't they happy with? What was, what was the experience? And how could I optimize the experience by modifying the product? So do I make something thicker, heavier, wider, smaller, lighter, whatever it was? I was trying to think about those methods that I could do to A, improve the product, right? B, how do I differentiate that product from my competitors so that when I go and launch my product, it actually stands out. And there's a reason why someone's going to buy it. It may not just be through a physical differentiation. It could be through the service. It could be how I bundle the product with something else. So lots of different ways of trying to differentiate. What's, do you have an example of how you kind of took a product and did that? Uh, let's see. So I used to sell maps. I, I know people with private labels. Some people don't want to disclose exactly what they sell. I know there's some things there, but yeah, I, I don't really care. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you guys ever come and listen to my podcast, you'll know most about almost everything about my business. I don't go into deep detail of everything I do and uh, all my products, but I'm more than happy to share this. Uh, so I used I started selling maps. That was my very first product, and maps. A cool story, an interesting yeah, scratch off world maps. Okay. So a funny story was actually two weeks into selling maps, I got a copyright claim from basically a fake copyright claim from a, a manufacturer. And it was funny because this manufacturer has targeted every other scratch off map supply uh, customer because uh, my supplier told me the same thing. My factory told me the same thing. So wait, and I was a, down for a few What's a scratch off map? What, what exactly is that? So it's a map. I could actually show you one right <laughs> now. Hold on. Can I show you one? Yeah, let's see. For people, I'll try to describe it for people on the audio. Here's an old sample. So it looks like this. Okay. You have a map of the world, and then you can just scratch where you've been. Okay. So you, and, yeah, literally can scratch the map itself, right? Literally, yeah. Okay. So it's like a, <laughs> now you get those scratch cards. It's just yep. like that, just a massive map. So wherever you've gone, you can go and scratch off and reveal the color, and then you can see where in the world you've gone. Really cool concept. At the time, you know, it was a fairly competitive market, but I thought I could get into it. So I did. And... I, and this is an actually an example where I didn't do too much, too much differentiation. So what I did is I redesigned all of the packaging, obviously. And what I did was added, I changed up some of the accessories and I added things that I thought people would like. I added my logo to the, to the design and added a little like ebook on, hey, this is, here are some cool ideas on where you can go and how you can travel around for cheap and all that kind of stuff. So I added some additional value there to the customer by just changing a few things in the product because there were already a whole ton of people selling these maps and there are even more people selling them now. And so that was just an example where I, I added some accessories and I added things that I think people would actually use to the accessories. I added also this other insert card, well, not an insert card, uh, like a, another little scratch off map thing where not map, but uh, like an A4 what do you call it? What do you call it? Just an A4 sheet where you could actually write down in a, in a marker that came with the map, came in the tube to say where you're going to go next. So okay. like, next on my journey is this place. So you can put that underneath the map and you can kind of look forward to where you're going to next. And that was my little idea. 
And so I, I and, had those. And you worked with favorite. the supplier that you met on Alibaba and kind of said, here are some things I want in the package. Here are some ways I want to display this, do this a little differently. You have to tell them absolutely everything to the very last detail. So an example of why you need to do that is I built uh, some packaging for another product I have in a box and I have all the designs done. I send them the designs and I didn't check the final. I So I had them manufacture the box and everything and they sent me over a, a sample and but they showed me pictures of it. I was like, oh, this looks great. It's fine. But and they sent me over a sample. But in the meantime, I said, Look, go and manufacture the rest because I wanted to get them in for Q4. When I get the sample, I open up the box and it opens up the wrong way around. <laughs> so you actually have to open up the box. The front of the box is the is where is the back of the box. So when you open up the box, the front of the box is the back. It's just everything's the wrong way when you yeah, yeah. everything's the wrong way around. Yep. I mean, it's it's not the end of the world, but I had 10,000 units of this thing manufactured. And now there's no way for me to go back and change that. What's the turnaround time like when they actually when you give them that green light? How long does that take to actually get them in FBA? In FBA? Oh, it really varies depending on the product. I've had some products that take between 60 and 90 days just to manufacture. And then in general for ocean shipping, if you're trying to get something over, you want to you want to bargain for two months from the time it because I can walk through some of the steps that they go through from having completed manufacturing the product. So let's say everything's manufactured, right? They're packed in boxes. Now you've got to take those boxes and put them into a truck. They're going to be taken over to the, the port. They're going to be put into a, a container if you're shipping a whole container full. Then you're going to have to wait for that pickup, wait for the actual con- the massive ocean freighter to pick up your actual container. That could be another few days. Then it sits on the water coming over for anywhere between 15 days to a month coming in. Then it sits at the port wherever you're letting it off. Let's use LA for my example. I usually ship most of my stuff to LA because it's the quickest time, less le- least amount of time on the water. Then it sits there for a while till you actually get your your container unloaded. Then you wait and you either take it to a warehouse or you have to make an appointment with Amazon to actually truck all that into Amazon. Then Amazon eventually receives it, but then they then take time to receive the stock. So they put it in and eventually they're processing all the units and then some of the units may be available. Sometimes they distribute them across different fulfillment centers, and that takes more time. So usually you need to bargain for around two months to take your products from being at a factory in China to being available to sell in FBA. Yeah. Okay. And this, and it's not an exact time either. So if you want it done in a certain date, you need to even get started. You need to give it three months even. You need to give a little more um, and buffer in some time because it could get stuck up in customs uh who knows there's things and that happen <laughs> this exact thing happened to me so happy prime day i had nine thousand units of two products stuck because and not here on time because before they left china they went through a customs check and i lost 15 days yep. so now that products are it's been in, and here's the other thing it's been in the u.s since the second of july and it's still not even being received by amazon so that time window that i mentioned which is you know from the port to Amazon usually should be about five to 10 days. So far has been what, 15 days for me so far. And now at what point did you actually have to pay for this product? Because you know, all this time where it's in the water, you've already paid for that. Correct, correct. So yeah, it's a, it's a tough, tough, uh, tough, you have to negotiate, right? So initially I would have to pay for my deposit upfront, which was a say 30% of the order. And before it ship, I have to pay the other 70%. That those are standard terms in China for most new private label people who are trying to build a private label business or start their first product. Thirty before seventy one of chips, and that's if you just met them, no relationship sort of thing. Yeah, those are standard terms. I mean, I've negotiated better terms up front, like a fifteen percent, fifteen eighty five. But then where terms get better is when they will actually ship. They will ship with just a deposit. And then you can like pay when they receive when you receive at port, which is what I was doing with this product, which was great. But then still, I haven't received it, right? So, but it's a so the most important lesson. So I made tons of mistakes in 2017, thinking I could get all this product out in Q4 before Christmas. So I only managed to get one launched out of the seven I was planning. So I spread myself super thin on all these products, not thinking about the cash flow and how I could reorder. 
So that put me in a bit of a predicament now where I'm like, oh my God, I, I you know, I, I'm, I'm starting to generate all this revenue. And then I'm like, then I'm suddenly stuck because I looked ahead. I was like, how do I reorder all the stock? And I didn't have enough cash flow to reorder. So you have to bank for being out of uh, a lot of cash for a while. And, and I, I did a presentation on this a while ago for a, for a summit and for an Amazon seller summit. And I, we went through it and it's pretty much you need to bank for th- whatever your first order is. Put three times that amount aside to be able to place that initial order, whatever it is. And, and so that's only if you're going to order the same number. If you're going to order more, you need even more aside. But if you're going to, say you order a thousand units and then you're going to want to reorder another thousand units, you need three times that amount, whatever that cost is, to account for all the shipping, the advertising cost, the launch, and then being able to reorder. It's about three times because you can't rely on actually the the profits you're going to make from that first order because by the time you actually start selling, you're going to need to place that next order. If you're selling well, you're going to need to place that next order to get that next shipment in, in time to be actually then to be able to continue to stay in stock. Because one of the most challenging things when you're selling on Amazon, specifically private label, is that when you run out of stock, you poss- you're probably going to have to relaunch. And there's all these different strategies to relaunch, but it, at the end of the day, it's going to cost you money because as soon as you run out of stock, your ranking starts to dip and it starts to dip and it starts and that, to dip because you're not in stock anymore. That's the thing right there. So you don't want you don't want to be out of stock because that that rank that you spent so much time. So we should get to that. But that rank that you spent so much time acquiring and, you know, let's say all the other maps and the scratch off maps that you're competing against, you started kind of moving up the rank. So when someone searches for scratch off map, maybe you were 10th, but now you're third, but you're out of stock for two months you're going to start falling back down. Yeah, I mean, there's there's ways to combat that, right? And to try and be a, try and protect that ranking a bit. And one of the ways is to immediately immediately close your listing. Cuz here's what's ha- here's what happens when you actually run out of stock. If you run out of stock and you keep your listing open, customers are going to go to that listing still. They're still going to click on your product and then they're going to see, "Hey, you're not in stock." So what that translates to is a lack of conversion. Lack of conversion means no sales, means ranking drops. So Amazon is going to keep pushing you down, pushing you down, pushing you down, pushing you down. Now, when you close your listing, that doesn't happen. Your ranking still drops because you're not there, but it's much easier to rebuild that ranking when you're back because Amazon knows, hey, there's not a, there wasn't a reason why it, there weren't the history. When you look at the history, there was there were good conversions when he was in stock, and now he's back in stock, and they can see. So there's some way the algorithm works that knows that you had a good history. Yep. So it'll help you get back to close to where you were very, very quickly, rather than if you left it out of stock and Amazon just pushes you really, really far down the rankings because the way Amazon's alg- algorithm sees it, at least until very recently, it, the way it sees it is that, hey, there's something wrong with this product. The same people, they see people go to the page and then leave without buying it, and people continuously going and then leaving they assume there's something wrong or who, they can't tell what's wrong, but there's something that's not working for people versus just not going there in the first place. Exactly. So much of that core algorithm, the A9, the A10, whatever you want to call it, is based upon conversions. If you're not converting, you have no chance of being ranked. Okay. So 3X, that's super helpful. What were you saying earlier about a copyright issue? You originally, so you got these maps and then you got hit with some sort of copyright issue? Yeah, so I'm making private label sound really bad. <laughs> <laughs> so well, and and that's the thing. If we go into any, sure. if we go into any of these methods, there's um, so many. There's pro- there, yeah, there's sure. and there's so many bad things that can happen in any of these. And it's one of those things that you've. Um, I think actually someone said it at um, when I met you. There was an event. If you've been in this long enough, every one of these bad things eventually has or will happen to you. Um, and whatever method you're in, you'll you'll hit all of them. So that's kind of the thing. So. You know, we're making it sound bad, but it's not as bad as we're just talking about some of the negatives. Yeah, I mean, I can tell you some retail arbitrage and wholesale negatives as well. So it's all part and parcel. But yeah, so with the with the whole with the sorry the copyright issue. So yeah, I launched these maps, and somebody said they had a a patent on scratch scratch off wall map or something along those lines. And so here's here's one of the challenges of private label and on, going to a, your scratch off wall map or just scratch yeah. off wall maps like all of them. Well. Well, yeah, this was the term. Scratch map was the okay. specific term. But how do you copyright scratch map and how am I infringing on it? It's a general generic term, right? So that's one of the challenges of private label and going into a super competitive market is people will do anything to knock you off. And it's it's a it's pretty cutthroat. 
And so I hired a lawyer. I had actually had CJ Rosenbaum on my show about a month before that. So I knew who to call. <laughs> and I had him and his team help me get back. And so it was a completely legitimate claim because my product was nothing like theirs. It was, it was clear differentiation with the product. So we went through the process and it took about two and a half weeks, but I came back up. But then I had to go through that same process again, right? I had, I had the same issue because I had to go and relaunch the product again. So it was it was a challenge. But that can happen to anybody. There's there's lots of what you call black hat tactics that go on to attack different competitors. But the way I try and avoid that is just by not going into the most competitive markets because they tend to have those types of issues, but markets that aren't as competitive tend to be easier to navigate and have less of those big black hat players who are doing millions who are going to come and try and destroy you. <laughs> At least that's what I found. What's an example of a big competitive market versus a you know, lesser competitive market? Supplements. Okay. Yep. Supplements, uh, a lot of beauty brands, like imagine trying to launch a lip balm or think about a yoga mat. It's crazy. Uh, with less competitive, it tends to be just bigger, more expensive items. Uh, I don't even know. Uh, I'd have to think. It's hard to even uh, come up with something on top of my head. But stuff that it's easy to think. If you think something's like say over a hundred bucks and it's a high barrier to entry, it's heavy and it's big. It's going to be harder for lots of people to get into that market. Fidget spinners, well, they cost twenty cents to manufacture, probably less each. You know. Anyone could do that. Anyone can buy high volume things. things that are just gonna move, fly off the shelves. And it's so so easy to ship, so easy to store. There's hardly any cost to it, right? So anybody can get into that market. So that's one of the other things I I try and do, and with the markets that I investigate and try and get into. And everyone's different, right? But for me, I prefer to have a few more barriers to entry, so that I know that if I come up with an idea on how to differentiate a specific product and it's bigger and it's heavier and it's, and it's going to cost X amount, maybe the cost is going to be 20 bucks per unit. I know that I'm already probably knocking out 80% of my potential competitors because they aren't going to want to spend $20,000 on 1,000 units on their first order, right? Or any order for that matter. So, and you see... For those types of products, you'd see people come and go. You see people try and test the water. So sometimes they come in with 100 units or something, and they sell out, and then they're gone. And maybe they come back again. But it's easier than going into a market where something costs 50 cents, and it's really easy for anyone to just put 500 bucks in or 1,000 and ship a whole load over. And when you say someone's coming in, so there's a difference between, let's say you sell maps, somebody coming in with a competing map, for somebody coming in on your listing, trying to sell your map. Um, those are two very different things. So one is competition, the first one, where you know, someone's coming in with a similar map or a different map, and whatever. And trying to beat your map. Uh, yeah, and it's okay. a customer's using the exact same search terms and they're appearing in the results. That's pure competition. The other thing you're mentioning is hijacking, which is totally illegal, but it's not because when you... When I first had a hijacker, I, I called up Amazon and said, hey, look, there's someone on my listing. They shouldn't be there. And their response was, Amazon is an open market. Anyone can sell where they want. Oh, really? So hijacking is not against their terms? I always thought that it was. No. Uh, officially, their, their stance is any, people can sell on your listing. But isn't which it? Which is how retail arbitrage works, right? If you're not brand gated, yeah. you can't stop hijacker from getting on your listing. Even if you have brand registry, you can't stop a hijacker getting on your listing. And I'm brand registered. I have my own, my brand is a registered trademark. So brand registry, let's let's say, what is that exactly? That's where, so it's so brand registry 2.0 to be exact, to be specific, is what Amazon has created to differentiate products that have a registered trademark. So my brand has a registered trademark. And so now I get a few extra features within Amazon to make my listings look nicer. I get a few benefits. I get a little bit more protection, but not much. Because again, I can't get anyone off my listing. If if a hijacker comes on, I have a bit more leeway to say, hey, look, here's my product and I'm brand registered, all these types of things. But it doesn't actually block a, a competitor or anyone else deciding that they're gonna they're gonna jump on my listing and try and sell my product and sell something counterfeit. Yeah, how does it? Yeah, how does it deal with counterfeits? Because if I'm selling Apple laptops and I just decide I'm going to make a laptop and put an Apple logo on it, 
that's obviously not okay, right? But does Amazon care? Or where do they kind of stand on that? Well, I'm sure they care, but there are no protection for sellers. There, there's zero protection for sellers in that scenario. What you do in that situation, and you know, Chris McCabe was there. We actually spoke about it on and at that meetup when we met. Yep, he's and he's been on the show actually, and that's how that's how we've all met actually. Oh, nice. Yeah. So when he as he was going through it, the, the only thing you can do is you know you buy the competitors' product, you report them, and you show and you prove to Amazon that hey, I bought the product, and here it is. It's not the same product as mine. Here's my logo. The logo isn't on there. So you have to prove the case, unfortunately, and it can it can cost a lot of money. And you can have some serious challenges with hijackers. I have friends who are doing over 200000 a month and over 100000 on one specific product. And he had upwards of 50 Chinese hijackers trying to jump on his listing to take. And it really destroyed the listing. And eventually he got suspended because of all these different communications and people reporting counterfeit products. Yeah, because then there's people on there. Yeah. Saying the wrong thing. And there's reviews, people saying things, oh, this wasn't in the right package, or and it makes the actual product look bad. Exactly. So that's tough. That's tough. And that's one of the again, it was in it was in sub it was in uh it was that was in beauty and it's a highly competitive market. And you know, it's just not something I would I want to get into because it's a really tough war to win. And it's a lot there's a lot of risk there. So I tend to stay away from it. If someone's listening right now and they're thinking, hey, then maybe this is something I want to get into. How much, this is obviously a very cash intense business and starting, you know, with retail, moving to wholesale, kind of moving up the, up the food chain a bit, you're probably able to build that snowball, but how much, if someone's just sitting at home and they haven't done this, how much would you say someone needs to even, you know, get in the door and kind of get started? And so it, it's a, that's always a tough question because it really depends on the specific product you want to launch, the brand and the pricing and the, the competition. There's a ton of factors that go into it. But I would say don't waste your time unless, okay, first of all, the 3X rule, right? Whatever your product is that you're planning on getting, if you can order a thousand of them, multiply that by three and start with that. If you don't know what the product is, a, a, real, a real minimum is about $10,000. If you wanna be, if you wanna have any kind of success, because- 10,000 10, in the first what, order or you should have 10,000 times No, 10,000 in total. In total, okay to start. And that's again, if you're going to be able to order something for around 3,000, 3,500 for your first set of units, which puts your cost at around three bucks, right? So it's the, the challenge is right now to order anything at that level is tough to be a leader in a market. So you need to get down, you said $3 per unit. Yeah. So that, so all of a sudden right there, the window of products you can you know, you can get for $3 per it's unit. It's completely cut. Yeah, like, you're, you're, there's really a lot of things, you're, and, yeah, you're not getting a lot of things. And the other thing out. there is that you're looking at, if you're starting off with just that much money, you're going up against 100,000 other people who are starting off with just that, that much money. Yeah. Right? The higher you can go, the less competition you're going to face in that particular market. And you're essentially giving that product more life by, lim that by uh, increasing the barriers to entry. It's a really arbitrary number, ten thousand dollars, but it's just to stop anyone trying to launch with anything less because you're never going to be able to reorder, you're never going to be able to stay in stock. So you're just gonna lose money. Unless you're planning on just having finding one product, selling it selling a thousand units and calling it a day. That's one thing. I'm trying to encourage people to want to build businesses and ha actually build a brand behind it, look for a six, seven figure exit in the future, which is what I'm looking for then you really want to think carefully about what you can actually dedicate to this. And it's not just the cash thing, it's a time thing as well. So even if you had 10, 15, 20,000, whatever it is, you really need to understand the end to end process and figure out how you're going to do each step and make sure you have a plan for it. That's something where I didn't really know exactly what I was doing. And so I made a ton of mistakes and yeah, I learned a ton from them, but they are very, very expensive mistakes that I'm still paying for. And so my advice to anyone who's thinking about getting into this is study we study really hard but the most important thing would be to hire a mentor uh -huh, get okay. someone who's done it who's gone through all those mistakes and knows what they're doing because once i got a mentor after i made all these mistakes it kind of just cleared the track it's like wow i was doing all these different things and they they've seen all these things right they know what you've done wrong they know what you're going to do wrong and they just put you on the right path before you have to go and waste that money on all those mistakes like spend the money on a mentor rather than spending the money making your own mistakes. It's just a shortcut to success. If there's any one, there's no real shortcuts because you still have to do all the work, but that cuts out a whole ton 
of the personal mistakes you'd make in the business by doing it on your own. So training and a mentor, and those are two things you see a lot of folks investing in this and education getting started, but there's also a lot of like snake oil. How do you actually know what training, what mentor, how do you, how did you pick out the, the good from the bad here? So that's definitely a, a tough ask and it's a tough question. The way I did it was I went to a ton of events. So another thing here that would really help in the business is if you network and get to know people. And I started going to events before I made a single uh, dollar on private label, before I even had a private label idea. And actually, this was probably too too early for me. I didn't have a private label idea, and I flew to China. <laughs> and I went on a China trip, a China sourcing trip, no yep. less. And I had no idea what I wanted to source. And you, you didn't know what you were doing, you just wandering around, looking at factories? I, had no, I mean, I don't want to say I had no idea. I had an idea. I knew what I was doing, but I didn't know what I was buying. I didn't understand how to analyze a product and a market and, and understand whether or not something was going to work or not. I didn't have any of that experience. I'd, I researched like 20 products before that. Now I've, I've researched thousands. I really understand how what it takes to kind of build a successful product line. Right, but before that, I didn't understand that. But So that's probably pushing it too far. Don't go to China without having an idea or anything. But, you know, Make sure you're, you're networking with people. Even if you're not traveling to places, go on Facebook groups, talk to people, ask questions. There are a ton of resources out there where you can learn. But it's, it's really easy to find reputable people when you go to actually meet people and you talk to someone up front. You can tell whether they really know what they're talking about or whether they're blowing air up your bump. Are you talking meetups or conferences or Both. what sort of? Okay, so it could Both. be flying super bad. across the US. It could just be a local meetup. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. Just make sure you find people. Okay. So find people and kind of, yeah, f seeing someone face to face versus just reading someone something on a, you know, a Reddit forum. Um, probably a different level of seriousness you can probably figure out from that person. And you definitely have to be careful because there are hundreds upon hundreds of Amazon courses out there, and you have to be careful of people who stole for a month, made fifty thousand bucks or a hundred thousand bucks in a month, and then decided that they want to go and launch a course because that was an easier way for them to make money. Just have to uh, watch out for that. Who knows, one day I might come out with a course, but <laughs> I'll have a long track record behind me before I do anything like that. And anything I talk about when it comes to courses and stuff is just, if there's something I recommend, it's something that I've gone through myself and I've studied and I'm like, hey, this all makes really good sense. Or you know, I've used this, so example, for example, with tools, that kind of thing. I, I really go through uh, a rigorous kind of and that's this period with things before I would recommend them on my podcast or anything like that. So courses, that sort of thing, where you've actually gone through them and kind of correct. Know, I've got something from them. A couple, and I've learned a few things, and I've learned I've learned one or two things where I'm like, wow, this is really good content, or why are they going through these steps, kind of thing. So it's a mixed bag. Yeah, there's some of those things where you start looking through the course and you realize I I might have. Like I might be beyond this level already, like by a lot. Um, and then there's other courses where you sometimes you get some good stuff out of it still. Yeah, but if you get that, even sometimes you get that one good thing, and that's the thing that makes it all worth it. Um, exactly. Yeah, and that's usually what happens when you go to conferences. I mean, you you can learn a ton from the content that's out there, but I mean, anyone who's gone to any of these types of events will always tell you it's all about the networking. Yeah, and the nice part here, in, we're both in Boston, having a there seems to be a lot of e-commerce folks here. For some reason, e-commerce is a, a big thing locally, and you can go to a lot of meetups, and that's where we met, which is kind of interesting. A lot of it happens here in Boston. Yeah, I mean, I think Boston's up and coming in that sense, and there's a there are a good few meetups that, down here that people, are, well, a lot of entrepreneurs like you and me attend and network at. It's definitely useful. Yeah. So any last tips you'd recommend if someone kind of sitting there listening and they thinking maybe I want to get into this. What kind of what kind of last thoughts would you give? So I always want to say take action, right? And do something about whatever you're thinking, whether it's starting an Amazon business, whatever entrepreneurial endeavor you 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 want to take. Take action and don't give up. But the biggest lesson I found was that make sure that you're the kind of person who's willing to push through the good and the bad. This is going to be a roller coaster. It's not going to be a wild ride where you're just always on the up and up and up. That's exactly what I thought it would be initially. I thought I was going to make 
half a million dollars in my very first year in a few months because I was going to hit Q4 with seven products and thousands of sales. That didn't happen. I had one product and a whole lot of losses. So, but I had the mental fortitude and the will to keep trying and keep grinding and keep coming back. And that's why I'm still going today and I have my own podcast and I'm busy as hell, but I'm pushing. And I, and I know the model is successful and I know I can make it successful and I have done. So just to come with the attitude of, hey, there's going to be good, there's going to be bad, but you're going to rise above the bad and you're going to keep fighting to make sure you make it a success. That's it right there. Yeah. I think people think there's something that's going to happen and you're going to figure it out. And once you figure it out, it'll all be, you know, rainbows and unicorns sort of thing. And, you know, <laughs> the sun will come down and everything will be great. But you don't realize once you figure out that thing, there's just a next challenge. And yeah. that's, that is it right there. And that's the job. And it's going to be figuring out that challenge and the next and the next and just working through them. And that's the job. So that's really, that's insightful. That's it, man. Yep. Awesome. I think it's a great place to leave it. I definitely appreciate you coming on the show. Thanks so much for inviting me. It was, it was a pleasure, man. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you.